Inger Stevens couldn't have played a villain if she wanted to. She was far too sincere and nurturing in nature, and evoked instant sympathy the second the cameras were rolling. Her earliest roles were all damsel in distress. She was almost always portraying fragile young women desperately in need of protection from the big scary world. As beautiful as she was, her talent was her most admirable quality. She committed a great deal of time and energy with fierce determination dedicated to building a meaningful career. After appearing on a popular TV sitcom in the mid-60s, Inger quickly became a household name. And in her final film, she even displayed a bit of Oscar worthiness in her delicate and highly moving performance. By spring of 1970, famed producer Aaron Spelling counted himself as one of her biggest admirers. After co-starring with Burt Reynolds, with whom she was sharing an off-screen relationship, in the made-for-TV film Run, Simon, Spelling cast her for his new drama Zigzag, which was set to premiere in the fall. But sadly, she became a tragic and wildly regrettable Hollywood statistic. Underneath the sunny disposition and glamorous exterior, she was forced to contend with some deep-seated personal unhappiness. After her death, the public seemed to maintain a curious fascination with her after it became clear the real Inger was a lot more chaotic than the halcyon beauties that she typically portrayed. After her sudden and unexpected death, the public suddenly wanted to know everything about her. At the least, they wanted to make sense of her life and puzzling death. An Insider's Perspective William T. Patterson published his biography, The Farmer's Daughter Remembered, the biography of actress Inger Stevens, in 2000. In it, he provided some answers to some of the more disturbing, lingering questions, but not all of them. Patterson chose to take a more positive approach to opening up her story to the public. He staked the claim that the majority of information that had been previously published about Inger was either untrue or highly distorted. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to Facts First if you haven't already. And stick around to see why many people think Inger Stevens' death was a murder, not a suicide. Inger's Painful Early Years the root of Inger's unhappiness likely can be traced back to her troubled childhood. She was born Inger Stensland in Stockholm, October 18, 1934. She was named after Ingeborg, a Norse princess. She was the daughter of Per Gustav, a high school teacher, and Lisbeth Stensland. Her parents got married six months before she was born. She had a brother named Ola, who also went by Carl, and another named Peter, who were born two and four years after her. Inger was a shy, quiet girl who was first drawn to acting after witnessing her father's performance as Ebenezer Scrooge in a local amateur theater show. When she was four, her family moved to Mora, which is about 200 miles northwest of Stockholm. Although just two years later, her mother abandoned the family to go run off with another man. Lisbeth ended up marrying that man and they moved back to Stockholm. She ended up taking her youngest son Peter with her in the move as well. Confused and angry, Inger and Olaf stayed behind with their stern and emotionally distant father. When World War II broke out, their dad decided to promptly move to the United States. But he didn't take his kids. He left them in the care of a family maid, basically forcing them to fend for themselves. Eventually, Inger and her brother moved in with their aunt, stage actress Karen Stensland Junker, and her family in Lidingo. After finalizing his divorce from his wife through the mail, Per Stensland summoned his two oldest children in 1944, after marrying an American woman and finding steady work as an educator at Columbia University. He then relocated the family to Manhattan, Kansas. Inger began to break free from her broken family. Inger was unhappy with her home life and ran away from home when she was 16. She found her way to Kansas City, where she found work as a waitress and eventually as a dancer in a burlesque show. Her father eventually tracked her down and dragged her back home, where she graduated from high school before leaving yet again for New York City. While she lived in the Big Apple, she met her first husband, Anthony Soglio. He was a talent agent who signed her to a contract and changed her last name to Stevens so it sounded more American. They got married in 1955, but separated a few months later. They finalized their divorce in 58. It was believed for the longest time that she never remarried, although speculation about her romantic relationship was a popular subject while she was alive and, after her death, it was discovered she had secretly married another man. Inger's future looked bright and promising. After being signed to a contract, Inger's career started picking up steam. She ended up finding success in both TV and film, which was unusual at the time. She appeared in The Farmer's Daughter for three years and in hit shows like Bonanza, The Alfred Hitchcock Hour, Route 66, and The Twilight Zone. In terms of films, she landed leading roles in movies like A Guide for the Married Man, Hang 'em High, Five Card Stud, and Madigan. Inger's last movie was the made-for-TV film Run, Simon, Run. 
She starred in that project with Burt Reynolds. It was about a Native American seeking revenge for his brother's murder. Inger played a social worker who eventually falls for Reynolds and helps him find his enemies. Not only did she and Bert have chemistry on screen, but they had a romantic fling behind the scenes as well. In 1970, Inger had 15 major film credits to her name and an equal quantity of television and theatrical roles under her belt. She was overjoyed when Aaron Spelling chose her to co-star in a new TV series, The Most Deadly Game, which cast her as a criminologist solving unusual murders. When the series was gearing up to begin production, Inger seemed busy, content, and successful. Inger's death sent shockwaves through the industry. On the evening of April 29, 1970, right around 7.30, Burt Reynolds left Inger's house after having gotten into some kind of argument with her. At 11 p.m., Stevens placed a phone call to her personal assistant, Chris Bone, and explained she had just argued with Burt and drank a couple glasses of wine. Stevens told Bone she was planning on taking a sleeping pill and going to bed. The following morning, a friend came by her house to visit and found her lying face down on the kitchen floor. She was dressed in her nightgown and a pair of tattered slippers. The person who discovered her said she opened her eyes, tried to say something, then fell unconscious. She had a cut on her chin covered by a band-aid and some kind of abrasion on her arm. An ambulance arrived and quickly took her to Hollywood Receiving Hospital, where she was pronounced dead on arrival at 10.30 a.m. An autopsy was performed at 1.30 p.m. at the county coroner's office. Inger had a blood alcohol level of 0.17, and it was estimated there were somewhere between 25 and 50 barbiturate pills in her stomach. Her official cause of death was acute barbiturate intoxication due to ingestion of an overdose. The plot thickens. A man named Ike Jones stepped forward to claim the body, claiming to be Inger's husband. Inger's brother Carl and her father and stepmother came to town for her funeral, and a private memorial service was held May 4th. The following day, Inger's body was cremated and her ashes were spread into the Pacific Ocean. It was later revealed that Inger and Ike had gotten married in Tijuana, Mexico on November 18, 1961. Jones was an athlete who attended UCLA. He was a multi-talented individual who worked as a musician, actor, and movie producer. Producer. Ike and Inger kept their marriage a secret in fear that it might potentially damage Stevens' career. Jones was black, and marriages between black men and white women were not very socially acceptable back in the 60s. Inger's family and close friends remained adamant in their belief that she did not commit suicide. They point out that until the morning of her death, she gave every indication that she was relatively happy with life. She was focused on obtaining both her short- and long-term career goals, was getting the kinds of roles she wanted, and was staying in the public eye. Sure, she was having some relationship problems, but that wasn't anything new. And on top of that, she had already worn off suicide as a solution for her problems. Inger's assistant, Chris Bone, was also skeptical that she killed herself. She believed that if Inger really was going to kill herself, she would at least worn makeup and dressed up a bit. Stevens had previously stated that after her first suicide attempt, she would never go down that road again. Biographer William Patterson also doubts the official story. After he examined the physical evidence in the room, he noted the bottle of pills that were found in her room did not belong to her, and the cut on her chin and abrasion on her arm seemed to indicate someone had become physically violent with her shortly before her death. After looking at the physical evidence in the kitchen, it appeared as if she was in the middle of making her favorite sandwich when she died. Patterson has a murder suspect in mind, but refuses to disclose their name for legal reasons. His theory is that someone who knew her came over and forced her to swallow enough pills to end her life. The motive, however, for her alleged murder is unclear and can be assumed to be personal. Now it's time to hear from you. In the comments section below, let us know whether you think Inger Stevens killed herself or whether you think she was murdered. And before you move on, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to Facts First if you haven't already. Click the bell icon to stay updated on all our latest content.